Hey, what's going on everyone, and welcome to my basic overview of the Mage Training Arena minigame. Before I begin, I've included links that you can click on to easily navigate around the video, so if there's a specific portion of the minigame that you're looking for, you can simply jump to that part of the video and skip anything you don't care about. Now, as for the guide itself, I'll quickly start out with some of the very basics, including the requirements, inventory, location, and rewards. There aren't any really specific requirements for this minigame, but obviously a higher magic level is key for gaining access to more spells. You can technically participate in all the activities with level 33 magic, but in order to make your time here really worthwhile and efficient, I recommend getting at least level 55 or higher magic before you begin. For the gear, you're going to want to bring weight reducing equipment, elemental staves, and lots of runes. The best possible setup that you can bring would be to wear full graceful, magic equipment such as a mud battle staff, tome of fire, and whatever other elemental staffs you can get, and at least a few thousand nature, cosmic, law, and any other elemental runes that aren't covered by your staffs. As for getting there, the mage training arena is located directly north of the duel arena, so the best method of travel would be to use the first option of a ring of dueling and then just run the rest of the way to the north. Within the minigame, there are four main activities, with each activity rewarding different types of pizzazz points. These points can be exchanged with the rewards shop, which offers a variety of unlockable items. The main rewards that players are usually after are the Master Wand, Mage's Book, Infinity Boots, and Bones to Peach's Spell. The rest of the Infinity Robes set, other than the boots, aren't a great investment for your points, and the runes are extremely expensive, so I recommend you only go for the four items I first mentioned. I'll go ahead and put the number of points required for buying each item in the description below. Once you have set up your inventory, teleported with your dueling ring, and have run north to the arena, go ahead and talk to the entrance guardian to get yourself a progress hat to gain access to the activities. Upstairs you'll find the rewards guardian, and at the end of the hall you'll find the portal room and entrance to the minigame's four activities. The four rooms are called the Telekinetic Theater, Alchemist's Playground, Enchanting Chamber, and Creature Graveyard, and this next portion of the guide will explain each of these rooms individually to hopefully give you a better understanding of how each activity works and allow you to unlock your desired magical equipment. So with that being said, let's get started on each individual room. The Alchemist's Playground This room requires the High Alchemy spell, so obviously you're going to want to bring lots of nature runes in either a Fire Staff or a Tome of Fire. The basic concept of this room is to alk the various items found in the surrounding 8 cupboards and to deposit the money you get from the alks into the coin collector. Every 10 coins deposited rewards one pizzazz point, and each point gives an additional 2 magic experience, making this the fastest room in terms of XP per hour. The items found in the cupboards are assigned alk values indicated by a panel in the top right corner of your screen, and every 42 seconds both the value and location of the items will change. Out of the 8 cupboards, there are 5 items, leather boots, an adamant kite shield, an adamant medium helmet, an emerald, and a rune longsword, with the remaining 3 cupboards being empty. The trick to quickly locating the item with the highest alk value, which happens to always be 30, is to memorize each item's location in relation to all the other items, because while the items do shift around, they always remain in the same sequence, so by knowing the location of one item, you can always know the locations of the other items. A pretty good analogy to use for understanding how the items rotate is to think of a standard circular clock, except for it periodically rotates and the numbers are hidden. Since the numbers are in a set sequence from 1 to 12, you can find any of the values simply by knowing the value of one of the positions. To apply this concept back to the alchemy room, all you need to do is memorize the sequence of items instead of numbers. The strategy for this room is to go ahead and search one of the eight cupboards at random, which is usually just the one that you're closest to, and use that cupboard's item to count down the spaces between your random item and the item with the highest alk value. On screen you'll see an animation I put together to help you visualize how the items move around. The sequence that the items appear on screen right now are exactly how they will always be, so as long as you memorize the sequence and give this room a bit of practice, you should start to get the hang of things. Now, a tricky part comes when you search an empty cupboard. Since there are always three in a row, there is no way for you to tell if you're at the middle or outer empty cupboard, so if you happen to select one, just go ahead and search a second random cupboard that is across the room to guarantee that you don't accidentally search two empty cupboards in a row. You're guaranteed to not search two in a row if you move to the furthest cupboard from the one you just searched, so if you come across an empty one here, you would want to move to the other side of the room over here. Since the value and location of the items changes, the number of alks that you will be able to cast obviously depends on how fast you find the items in the first place. If you find the best item on your first try, which is a 1 out of 8 chance, you can usually fit in around 10 alks. If you find the best item on your second try, which is most common, you can usually fit in around 8 alks. And finally, if you open up an empty cupboard and find the best item on your third try, you can usually fit in around 6 alks. 
One other additional detail about this room is that you will often see an arrow within the panel at the top right corner of your screen. Whatever item this arrow is next to will out for free and won't use up any of your nature runes. This can be a really nice bonus at times, but overall I wouldn't recommend alking anything lower than 15 coins, as it isn't a really great value of your time, so if you happen to notice the arrows next to a really low alk value, I would just ignore it. When you first try this room, it may seem a little bit challenging and hard to grasp, but just keep practicing or referring back to the order sequence of items and I guarantee you'll start to improve. The Telekinetic Theater this room requires you to use the telekinetic grab spell to pull a stationary rift guardian through a maze, so make sure to bring an air staff and a bunch of law runes. To go about solving each maze, simply position your character on the side of the maze that you need to drag the guardian to, and keep casting the spell in different locations until you've dragged the guardian to the final tile. Once you've solved a maze, just talk to the guardian to start another. Every maze solved rewards 2 points, and after completing 5 consecutive mazes you'll get an additional 8 points, 1000 magic experience, and 10 bonus law runes. I'll put the quickest solutions to all of the 10 possible mazes on screen, with the numbers indicating the correct sequence of moves and the green line obviously mapping out the most efficient path of each maze. As an additional tip, you can actually save a little bit of time by casting the spell a few squares before reaching the exact spot where you're supposed to cast it. It actually isn't required for you to stand on the exact tile of the path that you need to drag the guardian to, so as long as you are directly next to the wall of the side that you need to move to, the action of casting this spell still registers. So, for example, you'll see that here I don't actually need to stand in the exact path that I need to move it to, and can instead cast the spell all the way on the other side as I'm still technically making my move along the correct wall. Cutting corners like this will reduce some of the time you waste running to your next spot, and if done consistently will save you a lot of time in the long run. You can't actually cast another spell while the animation of the prior spell is still going, so try to utilize this time to plan out and run to your next move. The only real thing that you need to avoid while doing this strategy is casting this spell directly in the corners, as the game won't recognize which side you are casting from, and you'll ultimately just waste your runes and the guardian won't move anywhere. Overall, I find this room to be one of my personal favorites, and although it's not the fastest for points or XP, it does get somewhat relaxing, and with a bit of practice you'll probably find that this room can be pretty low effort and easy. If you ever want to refer back to the image with the quickest solutions to each maze, the link will be down in the description below. The Creature Graveyard This room requires you to use the Bones to Bananas or Peaches spell, so make sure you bring lots of Nature, Water, and Earth runes. If you have it, a Mud Battle Staff will negate the cost of the Water and Earth runes, saving you some money. The basic aim of this room is to collect different tiered bones, convert them into bananas or peaches, and then deposit them into the food chutes. You gain 1 point every 16 pieces of fruit you deposit, as well as a chance of receiving a few bonus Death, Blood, or Nature runes, so you may as well put some placeholders in your inventory. The annoying catch to this room is that you will frequently take 2 damage while standing anywhere in the room, so in order to survive, you'll have to consistently eat some of the fruit you convert. If you only have access to bones to bananas, then you'll only be able to heal a measly 2 hit points, so I highly recommend that if you're planning on unlocking multiple items, that you unlock bones to peaches first to make the remainder of the grind more convenient. You will definitely thank yourself later, because grinding this room for a long time using just bananas is honestly one of the worst things you can do in this game. I happened to make the small mistake of unlocking the Infinity Boots first, and while this isn't nearly as bad as if I had purchased, say, the Mage's Book or the Master Wand, it was still pretty exhausting and I wish I had unlocked Bones to Beaches as my first unlock and not my second. Now, back to the strategy of this room. Once in the room, head over to the western bone pile that's very close to a food chute. Within the piles, there are four tiers of bones that cycle in sets of four, with each tier yielding a specific amount of fruit ranging from one to four. You can play around with the values of the bones and develop your own strategies, but the strategy I personally recommend is to pair the 1-tiered bones with the 4-tiered bones, and the 2-tiered bones with the 3-tiered bones. Casting a spell with either of these two arrangements of bones will yield exactly 20 pieces of fruit, making this pattern very organized and simple, while also remaining fairly efficient. You can use this strategy with both bananas or peaches, as the only difference will be the amount of fruit you need in order to keep your HP up. Using bananas will require you to eat around 3-4 to four pieces every time you deposit an inventory, while using peaches, which heal 8, only requires you to eat about 1 time per inventory. Basically, long story short, you'll have to eat around 4 times more fruit if you don't have bones to peaches, so definitely consider unlocking this first. One last point to mention is that both bananas and peaches reward the same amount of points, so if you have bones to peaches unlocked, make sure to only cast it when you are low on HP in order to conserve one nature rune. As an example, I usually only cast Bones to Peaches once every 5 or so inventories to heal up my HP. 
Once you develop a consistent pattern and get the hang of the bone values, I find this room to get a little bit more relaxing, so hopefully you find it somewhat bearable even during the more tedious stage without the peaches unlocked. The Enchantment Chamber This room requires you to enchant various shapes and dragon stones into orbs, so just bring the runes required to cast the best enchant spell you have unlocked. Now, as for earning points in this room, there are two ways. The first way is what I recommend doing, and it's definitely the fastest method of gaining points. Basically, all you do is run around the room collecting the six dragonstone spawns, using your highest unlocked enchant spell to enchant them, and then world hop to repeat the process over and over again. The points you get per dragonstone is equal to two times the level of enchant spell you use. So for example, using the level 5 enchant spell will be 5 times 2, equaling 10 points. Using your best enchant spell will grant you the most points, and if you're just a few levels away from unlocking the next enchant, you can actually just use a boost, and the constant world hopping will keep it from going back down if you hop fast enough. This is really all there is to say about this method, and the only real catch is that you will often have to compete with other players and bots due to the popularity of this strategy. Hopefully one day Jagex will make this room instant so that there won't be as much competition for the Dragonstone spawns. Honestly, my advice for dealing with this is just to grind out this room during the slower hours of the day to avoid traffic, and during peak times to just focus on the other rooms instead. One other small detail is that the Dragonstones take exactly 7 minutes to spawn, so you can actually just get away with setting a 7 minute timer to alert you to when they're about to spawn, allowing you to reach them before any other players or bots get to them first. The second way is a lot slower, so I don't really recommend it, however, as I already mentioned, the Dragonstone method can be extremely busy during peak hours, so I'll just go over it regardless so you have an alternate method of gaining points. Basically, the aim is to collect the various colored shapes located in the four corners of the room and then enchant them into orbs that can be deposited in the center of the room. Pay attention to the periodically changing icon on the screen to determine which color shape grants points, and similar to the Creature Graveyard room, you will earn a few bonus Death, Blood, and Cosmic runes, which occurs every 20 orbs you deposit. As long as you enchant the colored shape that matches the image on the screen, you'll gain 1 point per shape, and after enchanting a 10th consecutive shape of the same color, you'll receive bonus points equaling the level of enchant spell you used. You get the 1 point per shape you enchant, so to save runes, use the lowest level enchant except for when you're trying to get the bonus points with the 10th enchant. Anyway, that's all there really is to say about this room. It's really quite simple. You basically just go around the room collecting the shapes and enchanting them into orbs, and if you're using the Dragonstone method, basically do the same thing and then just world hop every now and then. Anyway, that's all the rooms covered, and I hope this video helped you. I know that this place can be quite a grind, but just remember to pace yourself and take frequent breaks, and I'm sure you'll be fine. Now, this video did take quite a lot of time to make, so liking it would definitely help me out, and I would greatly appreciate it. And aside from that, I'd like to thank you for watching once again. I hope it helped, and I'll see you all very soon.